Well, that was the first they knew oh, that, that this was, uh, <laughs> as they call it, a colored baby. So I, I don't think it takes much imagination to feel the shock waves that went through. I have to read my book to get a bit more detail. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't think I have to, can imagine. Uh, I often wonder what, what must my mother have been feeling as she, did she hear the footsteps of her parents approaching the room? I mean, uh, it just must have been horrendous. Mm. Uh, awful. Imagine, yeah. Because I think, I mean, what this is showing is the layerings of prejudice, of stigma, of what causes shame. Because we had the illegitimacy, we had class, we had education, we had religion, and then you factor in race on top of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, has always interested me, obviously. Yeah. And it's, it's obvious you know, that decisions will be made you know, at the, uh, you know, on the news of every event. So, for instance, the fact that your mother, uh, you know, had a ch child outside marriage, but everything was kind of being decided on the basis that this was going to be a normal white baby would potentially adopt or whatever. But then, as soon as the news came out that you were mixed race, it was a kind of slightly different story, wasn't it? I mean, what the con what the correspondent showed me is that um, the utter sort of confusion and the constant changing of minds and opinions about mm. what was going to be done with me. Mm. I mean, initially, I think with all the shock, my mother was sort of agreeing to the fact that this is sort of early in the pregnancy when it became known that I should be fostered and she'd go back to university um, and there was talk of adoption. And then my mother said, no, no way. She changed her mind. And so that was causing a rift between her and particularly my grandmother. Then then I think as some of us who worked as health visitors, I, I used to be a health visitor, we've seen this, that as things progress, that, that there can be changes of opinion. As the shock levels sort of get lessened, sometimes, not always, but certainly in my family, I think, there was a sort of rethinking about well, what we're we going to do with the baby while... Mary or Maureen, as she was also called, goes back to university. So one one option was that um, my grandparents would take me in as their own, and this is not an unusual situation. So that the neighbours, I mean, the, the thing that comes through the correspondence, the neighbours mustn't know. I mean, goodness me, that was really the issue. And so one one idea was, yeah, when when I was born, you know, I suddenly be my grandmother's baby, you know. Um, but as my aunt said, you know, when they saw me in the crib, that was kibosh, was, oh, no way, that, you know, and it threw everything back. And then also I noticed lots of different variation amongst the Catholic clergy and the nuns as to whether I should be fostered, adopted, and, and in the end, I mean, my mother was totally against it, and, and in fact one of the nuns said, you know, nobody will adopt a coloured baby, and that put an end to all the discussion. Mm. And I, yeah. you know, I was, I, was, I went into um, yeah, the, the Catholic. Yeah, that piece fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. it just shows the complexity of decision making mm. in mm. time of shock and mm -hmm. horror. Mm. Yeah. The fact that your mother left it to the very last minute mm. to tell you her her parents. Well, she couldn't bring herself to tell them. Discussions have been going on about what we could do and mm. possibilities, and suddenly <laughs> this arrives. Yeah. 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 Quite remarkable. Multi layered, yeah. yes. So, do you want me to know, talk about. Yes, well, uh, about, yeah, about your movement and yes. that would be wonderful. So, yeah. I, I, I didn't, I was called, as you've said, Elizabeth Mary Furlong. Um, and I did my nursing, I did my health visiting. And I went to, I, I lived in France for nine months um, because I always liked French and I wanted to improve my French. And whilst I was there uh, working, I, I became very friendly with a French-African midwife. And over coffee, um, it always brings a smile to my, just thinking back to this, she was saying, um, she, uh, she said in French, but I won't do the French, but she said, Elizabeth, <laughs> um, who do you think was the best or the worst colonizer, the British or the French? 
I hadn't a clue what she was talking about. I mean, I took growing up totally in white, Irish, English culture, if you like, in, in, in England. I'd never, we, there was no such thing as black history. Uh, I didn't know what she was talking about. And she said, look, Elizabeth, you, I, I, know, I notice you like reading. You get hold of Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, that's... And that blew my mind. It explained why in Nazareth House Convent, at a very young age, I washed my face ten times with the red Life Boy soap and ended, ended up in sick bay. Uh, because I wouldn't, I can't say that I felt as a small child there was overt racism. I mean, there was a few things, read the book, but I knew I was different and I wanted to be like my friends. So, um, I knew I was different. So, it wasn't until, so uh, anyway, reading this book, I'd always wanted to know who my father was. I gradually understood he was Nigerian and he was a lawyer, and that was it. Never knew his name. So I wrote to my mother in 1972. I was coming up to 25. And this is her reply. I can understand you wanting to know about him, if only because your friends are bound to ask questions about your nationality, etc. And if you're mixing with Nigerian people, you just might, by some wild coincidence, meet him or people who knew him, know him. But although I've given you all the information I can, such as it is, I would advise you against making any effort to trace him. At this stage, it could have the effect of causing embarrassment to him and his family. She knew he was married, by the way, back in Nigeria got married and I can't see that any good would come of it. So that was March 1972. Are you keeping an eye on the door? Yes, so uh, I didn't take any notice of what she said. <laughs> As you do. Um, I could understand her anxieties as a mother, but I, I, I don't know. So I pondered over who might be the best person to help me unearth the Nigerian or origin of the Anion name. Due to the Biafra War, I became aware of three main ethnic groups in Nigeria, but later discovered that there were well over 250 others. Could his surname be Ibo, Hausa, Fulani, or Yoruba, or was it from one of the many other groups? There was no internet in the 1970s. More importantly, I had no contact with Nigerians at this time, and my black, friend, my black friends were mainly of Caribbean origin. However, there was one person who I knew who regularly attended a social club in, in, in uh, West London that I attended, um, the now deceased John Roberts, a barrister from Sierra Leone, who in 1975 became the first black person to be made head of chambers and the first to be appointed to Queen's Council in 1988. So I knew John, this is now the early 70s before all this. Uh, married to a nurse, he also taught Nigerian law students. So I decided to show him my father's name in the hope that he might recognize which part of Nigeria it originated from. It had taken me until the evening of Monday 10th of June, three weeks before my 25th birthday to work up to asking John the question. So this is three months after my mother had given me the information. John answered, he, he wasn't sure, but he promised to investigate further and get back to me. Uh, I assumed that this would entail a discussion with some of his law students. On Wednesday, so this was Monday evening, on Wednesday, just two days later, he phoned me at the clinic in Wembley, where I was working as a health visitor. To my utter amazement, he told me that he had found my father and had already spoken to him. I was absolutely flabbergasted and in a total state of shock. All I could say was, what, you've spoken to my father in Nigeria? His reply was even more extraordinary. No, in London, in Palmer's Green. <laughs> World. <laughs> I spoke to my father that, that Wednesday and he said, Come and you, and, now this is where the Nigerian comes in. 
you will come and see me tomorrow evening. <laughs> okay? That is why. <laughs> so I used to have a scooter in those days. Do you remember the mobilettes? Mm -hmm. Little orange mobilettes. So this is just think of me scootering up the North Circular to New Palmer's Green. Pulling up outside the house, the nerves kicked in and I could feel butterflies in my stomach. I was both anxious and excited, as after taking a very deep breath, I knocked on the front door. A short, rotund, bespectacled and very dark-skinned man opened it, and I knew immediately it was my father. He beamed at me, looked me up and down, hugged me, stood back, gazed at me again, smiled, and said, welcome, not. So the Ebos in the audience will know that's welcome. I can still remember the sensation of his warm embrace and the tears that came to my eyes. It was as though they completely washed away my mother's concerns and mine to a lesser extent, that tracing him would result in rejection and embarrassment. Mm. No, that's good, that's good, that's good. Just got a few more. So, my father, L.O.V. Anion, Lawrence Odiatu Victor Anion. There's some beautiful, there's a photograph that um, Conrad has blown up. And I, I think I've got the humour from my Irish side and my Nigerian side. Because something strikes me about this photograph. I mean, my devout Irish Catholic family. But who gets to meet the Pope? <laughs> and it's a wonderful photograph as well, absolutely beautiful. So, so my father, just a little bit about my father here. My father was born in Onisha, an extremely large market town on the eastern banks of the River Niger, in the southeastern state of Anambra, what was Anambra? Across the river is the town of Asaba, and the magnificent Niger Bridge connects the two. Historically, Onisha comprised the traditional community of Inland Town and Onisha Waterside. Inland Town, Enu Onisha, is composed of many villages or quarters, and the Anion family hails from the one called Ogboli Eke. A little bit about my paternal grandfather now. My grandfather, Akunne Julius Olisa Ozakwe Anion, worked at the United African Company, UAC, Limited in Onisha. I was informed that he was on the quiet side, with impeccable character, but quick-tempered. He had a total of 17 children, his first two, Walter and George, by a woman from the Nzegu family of Obioza village. Walter, who was a teacher, became deputy headmaster of uh, school in Ogidi, attended by the acclaimed writer Chinua Achebe from 1936. In Ezenwa Veto's 1997 biography of Achebe, he notes that Walter Anion was strict and flogged pupils excessively. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather had four wives who had 15 further children. Um, his first wife, my grandmother, who, who I never, I never met my paternal grandparents, by the way. His first wife, my grandmother, was Madame Hannah Etiana Anion, née Ejo, from Mwarali village, sorry, my pronunciation is not probably good. The eldest of her children was my beloved, I have to say, Auntie C. Um, followed by my father, and then Uncle uh, Chike and Uncle Sunday. So, um, <clears throat> moving on, um, I, I describe my book um, in terms of when people are, you know, what sort of genre is it? You know, um, I actually say, I think, think Philomena meets Barack Obama's dreams from my father. Um, because there's, there's a lot of differences in the two narratives, but there's a lot of similarities as well. And um, 
I talk about um, why these two books have had great resonance for me. As I'm sure very many of you know from the Philomena story, the book or the, the film, Philomena Lee grew up in Ireland and became a single mother in 1951 at the age of 18. Like my mother, she looked after her, in her, case, her son in a Catholic mother and baby home, but for the much longer period of three years. Then the nuns arranged for him to be adopted by an American couple without Philomena's consent. After searching for her son for 50 years, she sadly discovered that he had died. And I reiterate what I mentioned earlier. Did my skin colour, together with the respectable status of my grandparents and my mother's determination, prevent us from experiencing such deception ourselves? Turning to Obama, Obama's first journey to Kenya in 1988 has an interesting parallel with mine to Nigeria in 1973. I was 26 when I first visited Africa and he was 27. We both returned from those visits with a, possible, with a possibly over-romantic view of our trips, but we both felt extremely welcomed and had the sensation of coming home. There were also similar experiences at the airport, be that for Obama in Nairobi or for me in Lagos. While waiting to be collected, both the people collecting us turned up late, for various reasons. We both spoke to somebody at the airport who immediately recognised the names of our fathers. Um, actually, that's all the extracts. That's lovely. Thank you very Thank you. much. That's lovely.